way. The U.S. walking off the field, scratching their heads. Unbelievable. Sweden with the pull. USA getting things going up forward again. A critical mistake by Dennis Warson. He didn't realize the pass was heading toward him. This could be it. They're within one point of the greatest upset in ultimate history. I mean, these guys are liabilities with the disc in their hands. They get it, you pressure them, and right in their face. Rise above, we're gonna rise above. Rise above, we're gonna rise above. The next person would come up, cut up the side. The next person would come up, cut up the side. Hardcore! Hardcore! Go out there. They're intense, fiercely competitive, abrasive, and not surprisingly, they're all New Yorkers. On May 8th, 1989, Sports Illustrated magazine ran an article about Ultimate Frisbee, about a team with no name hailing from New York that would change the game forever. I remember sitting with Kenny and saying, we're gonna dominate, we're gonna dominate this sport, we're gonna take it to a new level. The article provided some major publicity for the sport and the brash New Yorkers. New York had an unprecedented string of success following the Sports Illustrated article. What can you say about New York? For years, they've been one of the best teams in Ultimate. Top to bottom in their roster, they're stacked. They've got great athletes. Expect to see a great game out of them. Before New York, New York's rise, I certainly didn't know of any other group that were working as many hours as they were on a not exactly lush field. That's how you fake cut. It's not a game out here. This is your life. Nobody else did anything like that. Was it fun? Hmm, I don't know if it was fun. But that success was not without controversy. We really changed the game, and, and people didn't like the way we changed the game. They and other elite urban teams from the 1980s brought not only structure and sophistication to Ultimate, but also a high level of intensity. We know we're the best, and we know we can make it in the toughest city and in the toughest game, and that's why we're together. Some thought too much intensity. Somebody contacted me as we were talking, a reader contacted me and said, I have a story for you. And every time they say that, that um, automatically, you know, cancels out any story. This one turned out to be pretty good. What really struck me was just the joyfulness of the whole thing. The sports should be fun, and that's why it all started. Why else would we possibly do this? Especially these sort of niche sports, which I think Ultimate really is, and maybe one day it won't be. Maybe it'll be one of the mainstream sports. It's certainly got a, a great following. Ultimate's participation and popularity have skyrocketed in the new millennium. USA Ultimate, the sports governing body, estimates there are now over five million men, women, and children playing Ultimate on six continents. People, once they see it, they just love it. Frisbee uh, very popular. Japanese, the Australians, the Swedes, the English. I mean, there's so much development of quality ultimate around the world. I'd say ultimate frisbee is is a drug. You get in and you don't want to leave. It's a group of fantastic people that love something and want to share that that passion and that love. It's definitely um, more of a way of life than just a sport. And probably most stunning of all, there were no referees. And what are Americans going to do if they're not yelling at referees? At the college level, over 700 schools now compete. There's no championship played at the college level that starts with that many teams. Stay low, stay low, stay low. Stay low. Yeah. Yeah. He was playing ultimate frisbee. He went up, and somebody cut him under his leg. It, it is clear replacement refs were in the game. Not one, but two professional ultimate leagues now exist in the United States. Whatever happened to just plain old with Frisbees? <laughs> well, I guess they got it a little more advanced. I think so, Mike. I do feel like we're on the brink of something that's going to just kind of explode, and already is. You can imagine how I felt when I've actually seen Ultimate in the ESPN top 10 of the day in sports. It's like Ultimate Frisbee because to play like this when dude just lays out. We knew in the 70s that there were five plays in every game that deserve to be on the nightly news. They love the bomb.
Hello, I'm George Plimpton. Like everyone else, I thought Frisbee was just a game of catch played by two or more people in a park or at the beach. But for several thousand athletes around the world, ultimate Frisbee is a demanding full-time sport of non-stop running, accurate throwing, and all-out diving to catch that plastic disc. Now, if you look here, down underneath, on one of these older models, you'll find the company's motto. It may be hard to see, but what it says is, play catch, invent games. And that's just what some students did back in 1968 in the parking lot of Columbia High School in Maplewood, New Jersey. It was there that they invented the game of ultimate frisbee. Ultimate Frisbee was born in the turbulent anti-establishment, anti-war late 1960s, almost as an anti-sport. Instead of a ball, they used a flying disc, and instead of officials, they played with this thing called the spirit of the game, whereby the players themselves would work out all disputes, even at the highest levels. John Cohn was one of the original Columbia High School crew. I think I played probably every night of my life from 1970 till like you know 73 when i got out of high school on that parking lot you know in on the ice in the in the rain we played virtually every single night year round you start with a bunch of high school teammates from columbia high school in maplewood new jersey and they all go off to college and a fair number of them decide to keep going and try to start teams at their colleges rutgers had a big advantage at the beginning because it was in New Jersey, and it's the New Jersey State University, so multiple players wound up there, so they were a strong team. The first intercollegiate ultimate Frisbee game was played at Rutgers University between Rutgers and Princeton on November 6, 1972, on the 103rd anniversary of the first American football game between the same two schools at the same location. It was a huge crowd tremendous press. We won by two, the same margin as the football game. I mean, there were lots of cool things. And next for us was we got funding as a club sport uh, at Rutgers. And I think we were the first to do that. And we took the money and put it into renting a bus, which we said, well, now we're going to make a, a kind of barnstorming tour. And we just would pull up and pile out of the bus and play Cornell. And then move on and play Rensselaer later that day. I mean, it was, it was really fun. 40 years later, a new generation of college kids had a similar idea. The result, next gen. It's kind of an open landscape, and you can make your own league, or you can make your own tour. My name is Kevin Minderhout. Kevin thought it would be an awesome idea to get the best college players in the country together and tour around playing the best club teams in order to showcase the sport. So we're just gonna get on this bus and I'm gonna get the best players that I know playing ultimate that are in college. We're gonna get on a bus, we're gonna go around and we're gonna play ultimate. It kind of reminds me of the barnstorming baseball days. You know, when, when teams would get together and travel around the country and play whoever the locals were. And, and it became a community event and everybody came out to watch it. Next gen. Next gen. Next gens, I mean, the, what what that tour did this year, the quality of the team and the results they got, wow, wow. There is some talent coming out of college these days. Dylan Freechild on Incredible T. A lot of these guys, I didn't really know them. I didn't know them personally. It's just like I watched them play. I was like, hey, come play on my tour. And so I haven't even talked to some of these guys yet. I'm not sure they even know what it looked like, but. They will. Nobody ever like plays in their own city. They go to these, you know, three, four tournaments a year. And so I wanted to bring that. So it was a lot about like bringing people, allowing people to enjoy Ultimate and like actually appreciate the talents of the, the top players. We were 
surfers. We were restaurant workers. We were blue collar workers. We were students. Tom Kennedy grew up out west. He and his Santa Barbara buddies were tired of just throwing the disc around. So they decided to try something different. I believe it was 74 that we started playing this team field sport. At the time, didn't call it ultimate because we didn't know what ultimate was. We were at the Santa Barbara Mission lawn and we had maybe 10 or 12 people there throwing around. We said, hey, let's do a field game some kind. And we set up a field, and, you know, basically shoes on the corner of the, the goals. And we played for an hour and a half, a couple hours till dark. Well, I just kind of went, whoa, that was fun. Let's do that some more. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. What used to take place every summer was a Frisbee championship that was held in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. This happened pretty much every year from 1975 to 81. I was doing some things having competitions that were essentially on a track and field format. They also would have a demonstration of ultimate. So this is August 75 and January 76. We literally had our first ultimate game with another team. Pass. Tom Kennedy checks and in Brewer and scores for the West. Coming up next, probably the best known of all events for the spectators. Ashley Whippet, the greatest in the world, has gone 10 feet in the air for a catch. Also, we'll have kind of a unique game in Frisbee. A little bit like football, a little bit like soccer, a little like basketball. It's called Ultimate, Fred, and it's kind of fun to watch and play. Oh, they move rapidly. And, it, and the thing I it thoroughly enjoy about this game, no officials. It's really a game of integrity. Uh, it's a game where the players really officiate themselves. And it's kind of a new wave sport. And I think many schools are going to be very interested in the uh, game of Ultimate. Well, you've seen in baseball, throwing out the first ball. You've seen the toss of the coin in football. Now you're seeing the toss of the Frisbee to start things off. I think she may be recruited out there by a number of these teams. <laughs> We're looking at the ultimate all-stars. They'll be playing the Santa Barbara Condors. So the ultimate all-stars intercept it. Here we go again. The all-stars going for the bomb. <laughs> And the club program around the country really is uh, taking off. And it's controlled by the Ultimate Players Association. With guidance from Roddick and Whammo's resources behind him, Tom Kennedy established the Ultimate Players Association in 1979, which brought together the champions of regional leagues throughout the country to compete against each other for the very first time. Oh, unbelievable. The disc is there. Last throw takes it. In 1981, a women's division was added. And in 1982, the national tournament was expanded to include 10 teams, the top two from each of the nation's five regions. By 1985, the hippies of the early 70s were replaced by the yuppies of the 1980s. The early pioneers who invented the game were hanging up their cleats and their bare feet. Bandanas were out and Dayglow was in. And new, powerful club teams were on the rise in places like Boston, Chicago, St. Louis, San Francisco, and New York. There's been a number of transition points for the sport, but I think one of the significant ones that I saw firsthand was from the, the day I first stepped on the field and those first couple of tournaments, really 79, uh, till just a few years later, you saw a fairly rapid turnover in the types of players who were playing the game. The sport was evolving into more about fierce competition and less about um, let's all have a good time and hug at the end. And on the East Coast, you had Kenny Dobbins, Pat King, Moons, Jeremy, David Barkin, Tom Hyman and all his friends in St. Louis, D. Rambo. Out here we had myself, Bob Six. San Francisco to be exact. Michael Dadham. 
Mike Glass in Chicago. The first time I played Ultimate and saw people playing Ultimate, I knew that that was the sport that I was really meant to play. I mean, it was just, there was so much about it that was so unique and great. Both of us went to high school together, and so we started playing Ultimate on the same team in high school in 79. Windy City. And a bunch of guys got kicked off the soccer team, the football team, for various reasons. We would all get our mom's cars, get barbecue stuff, and we'd have a practice at um, Crow Island Woods. And there were separate games starting in uh, Eugene, Oregon, in Oklahoma City, in Texas. Um, everybody wanted to play. It just kind of grew. I could see the, the sport evolving. I could see how incredibly attractive it would be under the right circumstances. We were at this moment where all these people all across the country suddenly looked and said, we're holding something very special and magical in our hands. This is a great sport that nobody knows about, and it's we're the ones who are going to bring it to the world. The crowd here is definitely anti-New York. We love it! We love it! They're going to hate to see us win this They're going to hate it! They're going to hate every second of it. We're gonna but let's keep it, it very it. clean. Let's not get in any arguments. Let's not make it ugly. Let's yes. put on a show of efficient, perfect, ultimate. Yeah! yeah. Our show, you can hate it all you want, you can despise us. But they're gonna have to all look at it! They're gonna have to look at it. We're the best and we're gonna show it now. This yeah, point, New York. Every go, single York. point, you guys. Long way to the go, defense New York. looks good, the transition could be better. We gotta crush, we got to crush them every single point. If we keep their offense on the field, they're gonna die. Fact! They have seven guys on their offense. Fact! We have 20 guys in our D. Fact! There's no way they can run with us. Fact! They can't run with us now. Fact! They can't run with us at the next point. Fact! The next point. Fact! Pat King and Kenny Dobbins first teamed up in 1983, and over the next 11 years went on to win more ultimate games and championships than anyone in the brief history of the sport. Dobbins was built like a New York City fire plug and would run through a brick wall to get at the disc. He could jump over the wall as well. Oh my God, how the guy built like that, able to do the kind of things that he did. The dude could lay out and catch things that were beyond catchable. When we met, the Japanese people met Kenny Dobbins first time, we were very surprised. Because he is the oh, same or high, not so big, but great jab. Dobbins timing it, goes up for and he gets it! A terrific grab! Well, once again, there you have it, your team leader. For some reason, Kenneth and I got along. We were both super intense, liked to conflict with other people whenever possible. You didn't want to touch the guy. You were like afraid to be in his presence. You know, we're like college kids at UMass and we're playing this club team and this guy comes out of the bus and it's like, who the fuck is that? Kenny was absolutely intolerable in almost every way, uh, but he was a hell of a player. And if you're interested in winning, you gotta have a guy like Ken on your team. King was a gazelle, an artist with the disc and a marathoner without it. So for Pat King for the score, New York making it. Pat King, I think the absolute smartest player ever to play the game. Blonde hair, tall, really good thrower. Good all-round player, great leader. He just looked kind of, he looked kind of smart. I know he was artistic. One guy alone is enough to carry a team. Putting them both together, how, how are you going to win? How are you going to beat them? You know, one's bringing everything that he can with his physical abilities, and the other is just a natural, natural-born leader who refused, refused to lose. I remember one of the first times I played against Ken, he spit in my face on the field. We were playing, and he was trying to intimidate some of my teammates. And I came up to him, I knew, knew him well enough to say, I'm not, I wasn't going to be intimidated by this bullshit. And I went up to him and said, Ken, and knock it off. And he spits in my face. And I wish I was kidding you. That's the truth. He spit in my face. And all my, my teammates were just like, oh my god, what is this? This guy's a psychopath. He's crazy. And I knew, you know, it's like I knew Ken well to know, it's just a big show. You know, it's just the psychology. He was just trying to play head games with either with me or my teammates. It wasn't, you know, and I wasn't going to let him bother me at all. I wiped the spit off my face, and we went ahead and beat him, I think. My impact was, was much more limited in terms of, of the scope of what I could do. But what I needed was a Pat, and what Pat needed was a me. So the next year, we formed Kaboom, 
And they were very skeptical of Kaboom because they thought Kenny was a psychopath, which he was. He needed to temper his act a little bit, and he did through the years, but you know, this was when he was young. He was a kid, he was a teenager when he pulled that kind of crap. But you know, through the years, he still always played with that same kind of intensity, and I always knew I wanted to play with him. Kenny was a person who, because of the way he played, he broke a lot of stuff. He, I'm sure he was like that when he was a kid. He probably broke a lot of stuff. You know, maybe not his body, but things around it. 85, uh, blew out my ACL. That was in the semifinals and nationals. 84, I split my kidney in the game and uh, playing a purchase. Kenny took a knee right in his kidney. He was running backwards, going up for the Frisbee and jumping up for it. And this other guy was coming up and saw Kenny coming and jumped up and brought his knees up and caught Kenny right in the kidney in the back and just took him out. I thought it was something minor. Um, I went back in the game, actually, through the winning goal in that game. My father, who's a surgeon, who's on the sidelines, used to love to come and watch his play, looked at Kenny and saw him starting to turn yellow and realized there was something seriously wrong. The pain just got excruciating. What I didn't realize at the time is my whole abdominal cavity was filling up with blood because I'd split my kidney, and it was I was just bleeding internally. And we rushed from uh, SUNY Purchase in New York, uh, outside the city, to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, where my father was a doctor. Rush Kenny in, he'd completely torn his kidney into two pieces. I remember when we went in, there was a, a stab wound and a gunshot wound. This was, you know, early 80s, all kinds of mayhem. He could have bled to death, internal bleeding. It was very possible that if my dad hadn't seen how badly injured he was, he could have bled to death on the sidelines. I never thought about stopping at all, except when I thought I might lose the kidney. I remember very specifically, um, that was all I was concerned about when I was in the hospital is that if they had to go take it out, that I knew then that that's just the way it works, you know? You've, seen, you've heard about people who lose a kidney. You can't keep playing any sport. You can't really risk it just because you can't live without one. But I remember specifically my father coming into my hospital room, and this was after we found out that I was gonna be okay. He came in and he said, so that's it. That's enough of this Frisbee stuff, right? You know, he, uh, he wasn't a, it's not that he didn't like it. You know, he'd come and watch us play, but he never understood our dedication, you know? so. So he said, that's it, right? You're done. And I was like, no, not at all. In fact, as soon as I can get back on the field, I'm going to be out there. He just sort of took a second. He didn't say anything. And, uh, and then he said, I'll never come. He said, I'll never come visit you in the hospital again. So, you know, what do you think? But a year later, I blew my knee out, uh, blew my ACL playing at Nationals. And my birthday ended up happening in the hospital. And true to his word, he didn't come. What keeps me going is an insane hatred of losing. I really hate to live, particularly to Boston. The person that Ken is indirectly referring to is Steve Mooney, captain of Titanic, a Boston area all-star team. For nearly 40 years, Steve Mooney has been an ambassador of Ultimate. Something that, that is incredibly important to me is um, the, the, the concept of Spirit of the Game. And I think that somewhere along the line, they got the definition mixed up. And when I say they, you know, certain... Spirit of the game to me is just giving everything you have to the game and playing hard, playing to win. But that's not spirit of the game. At least that's not how I define it. Others sometimes think, spirit of the game, come on, show some spirit. That is the spirit of the game. I mean, you know, and I'm gonna just go off because ultimate players, are nothing if not totally arrogant. And ultimate as a sport is, is really arrogant. This idea that ultimate invented spirit. You know, ultimate gave spirit a name, spirit of the game. But, you know, the, the human spirit of athletic competition has been around forever. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Spirit of the game, in my opinion, is fair play. Now, they got a, there's a definition, it's got a lot of words in it, but I always thought fair play. And we grew up playing basketball, playing you know, touch football in the street, whatever. There was no refs. This was not new. You know, you watch NFL football, and these guys are trying to kill each other. And then at the end of the game, they get in a prayer circle together. Like, 
that's not spirit of the game? You bet it is. Those guys are legitimate, head-hunting, murderous athletes when they need to be. The point is, I'm gonna do everything I can to beat them within the rules, within the rules. And that's a, that's a higher level of human distinction. The integrity of Ultimate depends on each player's responsibility to uphold the spirit of the game, and this responsibility should remain paramount. Sounds right to me. I think it is our responsibility to do that. Along with the new professional Ultimate Leagues started in 2012, came the introduction of referees. Well, I think the ref speeds the, the play up, definitely, to avoid all the, the stoppages. I see some pushing, I see some shoving, I see some stuff that happens in other sports, and I'm thinking that Ultimate with refs does start becoming like other sports pretty quickly. At the U.S. college and club levels, USA Ultimate now uses a hybrid system of officiating called the Observer System to resolve player disputes. And the team's disagreeing, so this is where the Observer may have to come in and make the call. When I started playing, it was, we don't want any officials, no observers, we do it all ourselves. And, you know, it got to the point where there was long conversation and debate, and it was boring. It's been interesting to watch. I, I like the Observer System. Slippery slope. You know, once you put in that, that third party, the respect and the trust is broken. When, I mean, when I started playing, I mean, I think every college practice you went to, there was something that was said about how special it is that you're, you're playing this game that's self-refereed, and uh, that's not the sense anymore. I think it's become much more of a mainstream sport in that way, that, I mean, these college kids, they're there to play a sport. Um, what makes it different and special is it involves a Frisbee. Whipped in, here it is! Championship! Pittsburgh finishes the game with an Alex Thorne to Max Thorne connection. Pittsburgh's first USA Ultimate College Championship. Hey, a beautiful flight of a disc to a receiver landing right in their hands is always a wonderful thing. And then when it happens to be your son that is actually throwing that, it does not get to be any more delicious. Bam! Championship. It doesn't get much better than that. It really doesn't. When I first started playing, I mean, observers were kind of unique. And now, you know, if you played a tournament without observers, it's a little bit strange. Internationally, the World Flying Disc Federation, WIFDIF, has continued to promote 100% self-officiation. Linkwitz is going to say he's in. Casino is going to say he's out. Very hard to tell. He is not happy. No, he's, he's, I think he's looking to anybody like, hey, here's my argument, will you agree with it? There are no observers at Worlds. WIFDIF has, has been a holdout and has stayed true to the um, self-refereed nature. From my perspective as president of WIFDIF, I think it's really our best branding opportunity. You know, you, you look at the Olympics these days and all the anti-doping stuff and allegations of cheating or, you know, what's going on with FIFA. When you go to a world championship, you're you're held to a higher standard. Watson reaches to Kittredge, floater, it's gonna be there for Kittredge, it's too high, and Hibber comes in with a late block. Kittredge calls the foul. The crowd, pro candidate the whole way, incredibly really unhappy with the call. I don't know, I mean, I'm seeing so many excellent displays at top level where it totally works. And he lets the call go. That was the right thing to do there. Hassel on the short ball. 16-15. And what an opportunity right Collins away. with the hunt, jump ball. The big Hibbert in there. Block, but Hibbert oh. on the assist. 16-16. Team Canada ties. High count. They're calling stall. It's going to come back to Kittredge. We're going to be stalling nine here I on the contested stall. I still cannot believe that people are arguing about fouls whether they are or they aren't, when there's a disagreement and the disc doesn't just go straight back and you continue playing. Nice pass to Cahill. Around to Kittredge. 17-16. That's game, That's folks. game. My take is that spirit of the game is what differentiates us, but there's room for observers within that. 
All spirit of the game says is, let it start with the player, quick review, move on. We're still moving faster than professional football. That has to stop and get under a hood. We see flopping in soccer. We see flopping in, in, in basketball. And all to sort of get, gain an edge. And, and you know, what, you know, I guess that's gamesmanship, but is it sportsmanship? With observers at U.S. nationals level and full-blown referees employed at the pro level, many fear that the spirit of ultimate is dead. But it's not dead. It's alive in the hearts of its players, like David Barkin and the many volunteers who support his ultimate peace in the Middle East program. Over the last six years, Ultimate Peace has brought kids together from diverse Arab, Jewish, and Palestinian communities for week-long Ultimate Camps in Israel. 120 kids, 14 different communities, and they couldn't be more different. We've got kids coming from Israel who are Arabs, who live in Arab communities, and we got Jewish communities. And then we've got the Palestinians coming from the West Bank, to get to camp, they have to cross the border. But to cross the border, they have to get a permit. And to get a permit, they have to go through the army and the police, and it takes time. They live in places like Jericho, Bethlehem, refugee camps. The idea of being peace through sport, let's bring some Palestinian kids in, Arabs, Muslims, Jews, Christians, religion not important to us. It's just camp, and it's just a sports camp, so nobody talks about that stuff. You just bring together these kids, you teach them the game, you teach them about spirit, and they just have a great time. And then afterwards, you look back and realize all that stuff that you didn't talk about is actually sort of playing out in an interesting way just because of the fact that you introduced this game to them. So we're actually giving this opportunity to a lot of kids, and we're making sure that we raise enough money to do it. He is taking spirit of the game to a whole nother level. He's, he's literally applying it to, you know, the Palestinian and Israel conflict. He's saying the world needs ultimate to deal with uh, hatred that, that is, you know, unmanageable at the political level. Seven. 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 What I'm looking forward to the most is the fact that we're going to, I'm, I'm going to know more people from uh, different communities, from uh, Muslim communities, and uh, get to know them better, get to uh, be friends with them. Muslim, Jewish, worship, no matter who, like, we don't feel like there's difference between us. What? You know, they, they leave their community friends as soon as they walk through that gate and we break them up, we put shirts on their backs, and they're with a whole new family. Bringing kids together in this kind of environment is the best way to heal deep wounds and um, create a family. And everywhere I go, I, if I see a Frisbee player, you know, I immediately have family. A family. Maybe dysfunctional at times, but a family nonetheless. The same group of players charged with pushing the sport's boundaries 30 years ago are the ones spreading Ultimate's good word to a new generation today. When I look back at the hostages, David Barkin, I think, you know, I was, I was out of my mind. You know, I was, a, I was certainly a hothead. Maybe it was a look that someone gave me where I knew I'd been wrong and I needed to change. But when I made that transition, it was liberating for me, it was powerful for me, and I wanted others to have it. And this is maybe why I'm so passionate about Ultimate Peace. The Blue Boys came within one point, but their man-to-man -man defense could not break the aggressive hostages offense. By the mid-1980s, Ultimate Frisbee was getting too big to be ignored by mainstream sports media. That was the first tournament, I think, in the finals of nationals in 80, or 85 nationals, where there was really a lot of media attention. In 1985, the Chicago Bears were doing the Super Bowl shuffle. 
Wayne Gretzky and Larry Bird were at the height of their careers, and Mike Tyson and Michael Jordan were just beginning theirs. What Ultimate needed now was a face to go with the sport, and TV network after TV network decided that face was Kenny Dobbins. Kenny's life is Ultimate Frisbee. In the seven years that he has played, Ken has led Kaboom, a team he started with a few close friends to compete in three national championships. Most players in the Ultimate community first heard of Kenny Dobbins at the 1985 U.S. Nationals. It's not a surprise to us that we're the hot team of the tournament. We had a really good attitude coming in. Most people didn't expect much out of us, so we're underdogs in their eyes, but champs in our own. That's a good way to be. Kaboom had barely qualified for nationals, but somehow found their way into the semifinal. In the semifinals, they came up against one of the best teams in the sport, Windy City from Chicago. Kenny has earned the reputation of being a fierce competitor, famous for his unparalleled intensity. We had a semifinal on a field with trees overhanging. Trees overhanging the field. Um, it, was a, it was very late in the game, close to game point. Um, someone throws a, a pass to Kenny. It hits a tree and then floats back in and he catches it. So can you find that in the rule book? I mean, in Windy City's opinion, it strikes an object out of bounds, it's out of bounds. We had a probably 35 minute argument. What is it? I'm trying, I'm trying, tree. I'm trying, but this is bad. I'm really trying, but this is bad. Those guys are playing ultimate in there. We're playing handball. I don't know what we're playing, but when you can't make a throw out of bounds and have it come back in on either side of a field in the semifinals of the Nationals, then we're playing a joke. You're right. There are many talented players in the sport, but two of the most outstanding are New York City's Ken Dobbins and Boston's Steve Mooney. George Plimpton and this other guy, the producer, had decided they were going to focus on Ken Dobbins, who got hurt and wasn't playing in the final, but at least they picked the right team there. They were focusing also on Steve Mooney in Boston. Typically, Boston managed to flame out in pool play, didn't even make it, I don't think, into the final fourth. It's tough losing. It's like any sport. And I guess part of the reason why I'm here is to win. It's not the only reason. I remember being cornered and thrown into a room, camera on me. You know, we just lost and I was bumming and there's the camera. And all I remember is if I could have that interview back, that would be great. Everybody's got to get the picture tape. <laughs> I think all the players here enjoy it. They come out here to play primarily. Not everybody can win. And so now's a chance to really mix it up. And that's the beauty of Ultimate. We get, you know, the tournament isn't over. I'm not going home. I'm going to hang around. I'm going to talk to some friends. So I really look forward to that. What the fuck? What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> it's not win or go to the party. It's, it's win or go home. They focused on Kenny and Moons, and at the end of the day, they missed their opportunity at telling the, the real story, which was, of course, my story. What appeals to you about this sport? Uh, that I play it. He's got Pat King with a nice diving catch with score. 2019. I went on that game and had quite a good game, good enough to uh, leave a lasting impression. Over to Ronar. Ronar scores the winning goal for Circus. But not quite enough to win. 21-19, a great game for the men's championship final. We were happy winning the tournament. We were very happy. It was a very emotional moment for a lot of guys. Now you can really say you're the best team in the right. sport because you won the UPA National. Yeah! By winning Nationals in 1985, San Francisco had earned a spot to compete for the third ever World Ultimate Championships in Colchester, England. The first true World Championships were held in Sweden in 1983. By the 1986 World's Final in England, 15 teams from all over the globe were taking part in a tournament big enough to be covered by the BBC. Hello, I'm Colin Turner. And I'm Andy Borenstein. And we extend a warm welcome to you to the World Ultimate and Guts World Finals taking place here in Great Britain. Peter Martin of the San Francisco Flying Circus of the United States to begin the play, of, and there's the play, Beauty. The 
United States have dominated the world uh, since 1983 uh, with the Root Boys from Boston winning and then in 1984 in Luzerne, Switzerland with the Sh Windy City team from Chicago being victorious. Was a great grab by Erickson. He's playing a good game. He really has. He's all over, all over the field. Another hammer cross field and a goal for Sweden. Oh, what beautiful. There was like a new thing in the seven, end of the 70s. A lot of players started all around the throw to get the feel for the disc. And then they realized that it was a, like a team sport. There's a goal by Danny Erickson. It's tied at 12. We have a game here again. Amazing. 12 12. Great game. Oh, nice throw. It's Paul Erickson with the disc. Paul Erickson from Sweden has planted more ultimate seeds throughout the European continent than anyone before or since. And his brother Danny is among Sweden's all-time greatest players. Yeah, they got the flow going now, Danny Erickson. First scene was the uh, individual events, you know, the uh, overall folks. And they, uh, in the mid-70s, at least in Sweden, they brought back at the same time, you know, the idea of, of, of the team sport of Ultimate. You know, Ultimate, in the end, came about and has grown like it's, you know, no other disc sport has grown in Europe, simply because it was a team sport. My group in the uh, town of Örebro, just ran by there, uh, we're all into team sports, and uh, that, you know, was what totally caught our attention. and. Uh, there was another group in the other town, bigger town in, in Sweden, and in, uh, in Gothenburg, and um, you know that's that's how things get going. Get someone to compete with. Sick made a great grab and a nice throw to Howard Jaffe, and a great drop, great, great drop, full extension grab. The replay will show the determination of Howard Jaffe. There's good crowd on either side, but just a misty rain, and it was, you know, it was clear that the the, the Europeans were rooting for the Swedish yeah. team. And uh, as we started losing the lead in our edge, uh, you know, you could see that it was, it was getting a little tense. Peter being marked very closely. It could be the last point again. Steve Corlang, is he in? No, I don't know. There's discussion. Yes, yes I guess that was the game. 21-15, the final. USA beat Sweden in the finals. And you can see from the uh, reaction of the big crowd here at Colchester that they have really enjoyed the uh, final. Brilliant performance from both sides and the uh, Swedish players. The first over there to congratulate the Americans on a great win. I think if we were good ambassadors for the sport, we would be in turn good ambassadors for the U.S. Well, you, what are the thoughts that you're going to take away about the strength of the game in Europe? We are very, very impressed with the goodwill amongst all the countries and just the general atmosphere of Frisbee. What we call the spirit of the game flowed through. Well, well done to you, Howard, and congratulations to the United States team again. Well done indeed. I was in high school, I was 16, and, and suddenly, within like a week's notice, we, we uh, realized that Dan Stork Roddick is coming to town. I mean, it's a small town in Sweden, not Stockholm, not Gothenburg. And we knew it was one of the, you know, founding, founding fathers. It had been a kind of a late night the night before, and we showed up that morning at, for Union Center to do this demo, and there were maybe 25 kids there. And when we drove off from it, we probably thought, well, you know, I, I guess it was worth doing that. But the fact that Paul was there that day, when you think of how many unbelievably wonderful things have happened since then, you think, wow. I had the magazines, we knew the names. We, you know, at that age, you take in everything, so to say. And, and really, and we didn't have anything like internet, and of course, nothing like that. We just wanted more of this stuff. And we, you know, skipped class, made it to that uh, demo right at, you know, it's like a couple of blocks from our high school uh, in downtown, see, downtown Örebro. You know, just to see him uh, in real life was, was blew you away. I mean, it just whipped up a disc, started throwing with me, you know, like, it's like nothing big to that. I got the opportunity to do uh, Australia with Joe K. Howe and then Europe and, and Scandinavia with Peter Blurham when he was the champion. and. Those were just unbelievable times. That's our roots, and I, have, I think it's important to, you know, remember why we got what we, you know, what we have. Masa Honda is known as Mr. Ultimate in Japan. End of 77 or 70, uh, 78, Frisbee very popular. From California, maybe surfing, skateboard, and Frisbee. And many college people are uh, playing freestyle and distance. And 
and then they started automate. The Japanese Frisbee Association is interested in having some Americans come and help promote the sport. PK, Tom Kennedy came to teach our college, 1980. And they had us going around to uh, malls, to commercial ventures, to universities, and doing demonstrations. Our team became champion of Japan, 1982. And next year, 1983, we went to Santa Cruz. 15 great American team and Japanese champion team. When we get there, and two guys are throwing and catch and throwing, and I was very happy and, hey, throw to me. He, he was a Michael Glass, and we became a friend. We're walking down the street in downtown Santa Cruz, and in those days, you know, we never went anywhere without disc in our hands, and wherever we were, it was a game of catch, whether it was in traffic, at an amusement park, at the beach, you know, at a disc golf course, at a concert. I mean, you just didn't go anywhere without a disc in your hand, and we saw some Japanese people doing the same thing we were doing, running through the streets of Santa Cruz. Next thing you know, we had a game of catch going through traffic in downtown Santa Cruz, and that's when I met uh, Masa Honda, one of the most influential people in Japanese Ultimate and we got to be friends. We lost all games, but uh, we made a good friends. At some point, Masa says, you need to come to Japan. We need to be forward thinking here. I must have done something good. At some point, they decided the following year to fund a whole group of us. I think we brought 10 guys the first year, and we traveled all around Japan. They, they paid for our plane tickets and put us up in their homes. Dan Weiss. Dan Weiss, yes. We went to six or eight different colleges and did one-day clinics. Myself and Michael O'Dowd, we called it the Japan Friendship Tour. And it went on for four or five years. And within three or four years, they had gone from, you know, eight or tenth at the World Championships to third. Over the years, Team USA has remained the team to beat at the world level. But the international teams have caught up. San Francisco's Revolver was representing the United States in 2012, but Team Canada were now the two-time defending men's champions, not the US. One of the things that's been interesting about international play is the number of teams that, in a small roster format, can now put together amazing teams. Glover, 16, 15, Australia. I mean, Australia, if you're talking about their 25th or 30th best player, can't compete with the U.S. When you're talking about their top 10 players, Australia has 10 players that are as good as the top 10 U.S. players. And Canada comes up with a huge grab after the back this Team USA 17, Australia 16. Lots of upstarts such as uh, Colombia, who are extremely strong and coming onto the scene. You know, we have new countries like South Africa, so it's great to see. And, you know, I think the, uh, the level of play really is is pretty even amongst those top uh, five or six teams. I will say Revolver is taking nothing for granted in this world. So, um, we, we know that the last two worlds, the US has not come home with gold. Um, and that, that's not lost on us. The only reason that we're not going into this game as defending champions is because a couple of players on an underdog team went out of their minds and took it away from our predecessor four years ago. Good morning from Osaka, Japan. It's a still and humid championship morning here at the 2012 Whiff Dip World Ultimate and Guts Championships. Only one game left in the tournament, the Open Division Finals. We've got the expected, Team USA, and we've got Cinderella, Great Britain. And this Great Britain squad is coming into this game, I think, in a wonderful mental state. G Bear with the disc. Dropped right away. Terrible start for Great Britain. Nerves. Great throw by Kittredge. Bo Kittredge is widely considered the best ultimate player in the world today. I don't think I've ever lost at a world. People know who Bo Kittredge is, which is fun for Frisbee. I think we should definitely have more of those people. I think within our community, it's awesome. I'm not sure who an ultimate, you know, when Bo is in his prime, is going to be able to cover Bo ever. Kittredge. They do get number 29, Bart Watson, back for this tournament. 
Bart is one of the all-time great champions. He really understands the game intuitively. He, you'll always see him in the right place at the right time. Watson can keep it in. Great, great, beautiful footwork by Watson. Using the win, Team USA punches it in on the second opportunity. 10-3. he in? Great Britain says goal. Kittredge, if the feet are down, Ford's going to say yes, and that's going to do it, folks. Great presence of mind by Bo Kittredge. Team USA, 17, Great Britain, 5. Your world champions here at the 2012 WIF Diff Ultimate and Guts Championships. You know, that last point wasn't quite as jubilant as some other tournaments that we've won, but it did cap off sort of a long kind of rocky week. Um, so in that sense, it was like a huge sigh of relief. Thanks a lot for the game, Griffin. Um, played in a lot of finals over the years, and the ones that I've learned the most from and the ones that I've gotten better are the ones that I've won. I was just telling them to keep their head up and not to let that game uh, decide who they are as ultimate players. I think it really hit home to them because they had a lot of good players but their good players didn't happen to have a good game. And that happens. Every good player will struggle. Every good team will struggle. As Team USA, it was a pretty different experience. It felt much more important. You know, it wasn't just us going and having a good time for our own sake. It was, you know, we want to go bring this home to our country and to the ultimate community there. I mean, that's the best part about these international Frisbee tournaments at this point, or these big Frisbee tournaments, um, is you get to see the, the community that you've built over the years. To be able to showcase to the world that there are still sports competitors out there who play by the rules and can be relied upon not to cheat, I think uh, really perhaps puts us on a level that not many other sports can claim. And the pull. Coming into 2012 Worlds in Japan, Team USA had also been the most dominant team in the women's division, taking gold at seven of the 12 total competitions. As in other divisions, the advancement of talent levels internationally have made Worlds a much tighter competition than in previous generations. San Francisco's Fury entered the game as possibly the greatest team the sport has ever known in any division, having won nine US nationals. But this was a home game for Japan, and they were playing for something else. Uh, last March, uh, we had a terrible tsunami and earthquake. So the Japan Flying Association uh, thought about uh, what can we do? So all money uh, will go to uh, refugees uh, of a uh, victim of a tsunami and earthquake. I'm so happy to have this uh, great tournament here. Nice bid, really nice grab. Makes sure with two hands. Abby Christopher, just a great physical presence. Bowen with the disc. Mizukiri, now they go to Idai. Jorgensen in pursuit. Can Idai get there? Jorgensen with the layout. Idai! Uchikawa, there it is. Game, Japan, 17-13. It was remarkable when they won. And that sounds strange coming from the losing side, but it was truly remarkable. Um, this giant crowd uh, chanting. And um, when they won, uh, their, their joy definitely was amazing. And almost all of them crying just and so happy. And like as a country, that sounds very profound. But um, I mean, we were contributing to a project for tsunami victims during the tournament. It was more than just Frisbee. The spirit of the game and the flight of the flying disc may separate ultimate from other team sports. But one thing that all sports have in common is the community that gets built based on a shared passion. That sense of community is something that ultimate shares with all sports. Back in New York City, two crosstown rival teams, Kaboom with Pat King and Kenny Dobbins, and Spot with recent college grads Dave Blau and John Gewurz, were both among the nation's elite teams. After we lost in the finals and nationals in 85, I just didn't think that 
we were ever going to cross the hump. We were never going to get over it with the team we had. We needed to have more depth. We needed to have more athletic talent. I thought we had at the core the winning attitude, but we needed more. And so for us, it was really like 86. We figured this was the year that was going to be our year. We, we'd been sniffing at the title. And we, we went down, and, and we just got steamrolled. We both realized that, that we were never going to win with, with that team. We were recognizing that things needed to change. New York Ultimate got together in, uh, in the fall of 1986. Uh, it was really Pat King who came back from Nationals and said, I don't have the team around me that's going to be able to go there and win. I don't care about the social order in the city. I'll blow it all up as long as I have the right people from the other side to blow it up with me. Out of the Northeast, 19, Titanic from Boston, 17. We had a lot of people to bring to the table that were a lot more talented than a lot of the players on Kaboom. We chose the players from Kaboom and they chose the players from Spot, and that's how New York Ultimate was formed. I remember sitting with Kenny and saying, we're going to dominate. We're going to dominate this sport. We're going to take it to a new level. We're going to put the pieces in place to, be the, to, to, to turn this sport into the sport it can be. I mean, these guys are liabilities with the disc in their hands. They get it, you pressure them, and right in their face. Despite Ultimate's gentle past, it quickly became apparent to everyone involved that this team was going to do things differently. There were a lot in the mid-80s, there was just so much talent that it coalesced around New York. It was interesting, like Mike Nevins and Amos Himmelstein came out of UMass, Dennis and Skip came out of Purchase, John Gortz and Dave Blau came out of Cornell. They were way ahead of the game when it came to building a team. If you take little parts of some of the teams that came before us and put them all together, you get something kind of like New York, but it hadn't all been gathered into one group for an extended period of time before. I dreamed about dominating the sport, and that was really the first step. And within a few years, we dominated. If you were going to compete with them, you couldn't just go about it in a haphazard way anymore. You had to get serious. And so that really ushered in the next phase of the development of, of the game as a, as a sport. What can you say about New York? For years, they've been one of the best teams in Ultimate. Top to bottom of their roster, they're stacked. They've got great athletes. Expect to see a great game out of them. Before New York, New York's rise, I certainly didn't know of any other group that were working as many hours as they were under, on, 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 not very, on a not exactly lush field. And, Crazy practice hours and crazy practices, and no, nobody else, nobody else did anything like that. No mercy, no friendly, they're crawling at our feet. We'll crack their heads and put them both in heat, heat, heat. No mercy, no friendly, that's the way it's gotta be. If you define spirit as right or wrong, your opponent makes a call and you should respect that, we were unspirited. New York City in 1986 is extremely different from New York City in 2012. In 1986, I lived on 92nd and Riverside Drive uh, after 9 or 10 p.m. If you were walking around in that neighborhood, you were crunching crack vials. The city had a much higher crime rate. That's definitely a trademark of our team. We know we're the best, and we know we can make it in the toughest city and in the toughest game, and that's why we're together. We used to joke about it, it would be harder for people to mark you if you smelled terrible. And we thought, what a great idea. Let's just stop showering. It's the fall in the Northeast, and we're playing in rain and mud. And we're literally going home and just putting on clothes the next day and going to work. So by the time we get to nationals, if somebody's covering you, you're going to smell so bad, they're not going to want to get anywhere near you. Neither one of them took a shower between regionals and nationals. I didn't shower for over a month. The truth was I did shower a little bit twice, I think, in that way. But I smelled bad. Suffice to say, I smelled terrible. It was pretty nasty. I didn't use soap. I didn't use soap. New York Ultimate reaches the semifinals, only to face their arch rivals, the Boston Titanic. We see this rivalry in everything, football, baseball, basketball. And there it was in Ultimate. As far as I'm concerned, greatest rivalry that's ever been in the sport. By 1989, New York's roster went deeper, and they had mastered their set playbook. 
Former San Francisco player Dan Weiss had borrowed the so-called Stanford offense from the West Coast. We had a whole whole play manual and it just flourished. From there, New York took it to the next level. Now, everybody's gonna claim they invented plays, but I'll give New York the invention of a four-person play. I mean, if they didn't invent it, at least they codified it by having it be incredibly high percentage. Stays with it, wide open, deep, set play, 10-8 New York. Dave Blau has it wide open, the Dobbins. By a long throw by Dobbins to Pat King, will he stay in? Throws it back in, unbelievable play, three blocks the scores. Oh my God, an unbelievable play. That is just unbelievable. I'll, I'll tell you, Scott, this crowd is going crazy over that play. The set plays allowed us to cut out confusion in the game. What did that do? It kept our offense fresh. And as New York puts in fresh troops, there seems to be a little bit more spring in their plays. I hardly even looked before I threw, and there was my teammate cutting me. I threw passes without even looking. Pat King to the right side. New York swinging the disc. Throwing long. Dobbins timing it. Goes up early and he gets it. A terrific grab. Once again, there you have it. You're... They just couldn't keep it up. They had to throw so many more passes and be on the field so much longer that eventually they would crumble. And, and they did. And it's over. New York wins. No one ever beat New York in a final after 89. Losing to New York was difficult because it usually wasn't close. It's over! New York! It was very obvious that we were seeing the best team in the sport up until that point in time. In 1991, Jose Cuervo Tequila, fresh off the heels of putting beach volleyball on the map, decided to sponsor Ultimate. In the time when Jose Cuervo was sponsoring tournaments and we won some of the Cuervo prize money, that helped offset some of our costs. Who wants to throw it? Dave, 40. Did we ever break even, not even close? Cuervo was intent. They come in, oh, Ultimate's the next big sport. And they picked a few of us, took us into studios in New York, radio interviews, this is gonna be great. In an attempt to make the game more exciting, a two-point gold shot rule was introduced and ended up deciding the first championship. Purists of Ultimate rejected Cuervo and resisted the idea of altering Ultimate's rules for any type of commercialization. Cuervo pulled out of its sponsorship after just three seasons. We were so immersed in the culture of it and sort of the importance of it that we thought that everybody else must get the importance of it too. And, and we were wrong. We did, you know, a piece on TBS and, and a piece on NBC and on ABC and on ESPN and MTV. But each of them was an isolated glimpse into a counterculture world that they thought was relevant as kind of a sideshow. It wasn't really about this is the beginning of an explosion of the game. It's not a game out here. This is your life. The one serious, significant relationship I had during our heyday, she kind of got it a little bit, but she didn't really. There's a cheer we like to use, which I think reflects our dedication to the sport. Um, it basically states the things in our lives in order of importance, and it goes ultimate God, family, job, girlfriend. Though for me, it would be ultimate girlfriend, family, job, God. You know, I, I loved her, and I really thought I was going to end up with this girl. And then the Amazing Games piece came out, and I'm so fucking clueless that I'm like, yeah, you should definitely watch it, you know? Watch with your whole family. I was watching with the team. It was gonna be awesome. Not even thinking that basically in the video I say that she's second to Frisbee. <laughs> so like, she's sitting there at home with her whole family watching. Though for me, it would be ultimate girlfriend, family, job, guy. This is the guy who wants to marry her and, and I'm like, Frisbee's more than you will ever be. And then I'm surprised six months later when she breaks up with me, <laughs> surprise. You're a jackass. Like, so I don't know. By 1993, age and injuries had begun to take their toll on New York. It was only a matter of time before the same highly competitive forces that brought them together 
would tear them apart. John Gewurz had emerged as New York's best defensive player and its most notorious. Arguments and even fistfights were becoming commonplace at team practices. All the things that people didn't like about playing against New York and playing against Johnny, well, we got that every practice. I didn't realize, you know, there's like all, all this angst, you know, going on behind the scenes. I thought it was just the way New York was. Oh, Your hands are on my arm as I'm pivoting. Johnny is so dogged, and that's what made him a good defender. There were times when he became you know, a little too dogged, I would say. The best I've heard about Johnny is possibly or probably the best man-to-man -man defender to ever play the game. 98% of John was hard work, physical ability, uh, and 98% uh, is pretty much the majority. <laughs> Worst I've ever heard about him is the 2% uh, the is sometimes wanting something so much that you can't be fair. Someone does something that's slightly on the edge of spirited, and then I, I would escalate the situation. OK, you're going to be like that? All right, then I'll also play on that level. Now my unit doesn't seem to be happy about it. He thinks he got bumped by Gewurz as he was going up. Like another hammer, there it is. Dennis Worsen for a one-handed grab in New York by the world champions for the second. Six foot four inch Dennis Worsen, AKA Cribber, was the team's youngest player. I remember when Skip brought Dennis to our first practices. He's tall, can't teach that. In the prime of his career by 1993, Cribber had become the new yin to Kenny Dobbins' yang. As long as we win, that's the main thing. I had my share. I'm psyched. Congratulations, yeah! Dennis Orson. And he gave us a dimension we sorely needed, both in terms of style of play and kind of his goofy attitude. This is going to be a great matchup. Nice play by Cribber. Boston needs to do Dwight. They need to stop Dobbins and Warson somehow. Cribber may have been brought on the team to cover us, but in the end, we were the ones trying to cover him. Uh, Jay and I had our hands full. Dennis Warson beating Jay Seeger on the defense. For seven long years, the team grinded it out in New York City at a time when greed was good and the glass and syringe-strewn fields were hard. After playing for so many years together, we definitely had developed schisms that, you know, people just didn't get along with each other. And it, it had been that way for years and hadn't mattered, but it was starting to matter. John was a convenient scapegoat. It wasn't about John. And I think I was a scapegoat. After we won the last national championship, I just graduated from law school, and I was starting a crazy job. I'd had two kids at that point, and there was just no time for ultimate. I had to move on. There's only two players on their roster that are over age 30. New York has eight. Yeah, I think New York has two Social Security collectors at this point in time. It's all over. The 1993 national championship goes to New York. That's a five piece. Big Denny Warson for the USA raises a disc, and the 1994 Ultimate Final is underway with the USA. The 94 World's Finals would be New York Ultimate's last game, win or lose. New York called it quits while they were still on top in 93, and it thus qualified for the 94 World Championships in Colchester, England, the following summer. The team voted to make the trip over. King and other key players had decided not to make the trip early on, and then just weeks before the tournament, Dobbins pulled out. When you want it, that's, that's just your being. It's who you are. It's everything. Um, but when you don't want it anymore, you, you, the, the emptiness is real. And that's, that's easier for me, because that was the thing that told me I was done. We decided to, to keep the team together for that one last tournament. Listen up! If they post, hey! Okay. okay. Setting. Setting. Okay. I'm a one. It was madness. Who's in? There was no real leadership going on in the huddle. That was crazy, you know? Pat's not going. We think Kenny's going. And then he pulls out at the last minute. And no Bob DeMann, no Dave Blau. It was like the first sign of the apocalypse. It's an unspectacular. Very important wing play from him. It goes long. A chance here. If he can make the grab as a goal, but no, before oh Namai Yunan can make it, it was it was a spectacular play. Looking at that game pretty much whole, all the way through, it didn't look like we were going to win. It's on Sweden. Now ahead. 
1918, the U.S. walking off the field, scratching their heads, thinking they had a defensive play, but no. Unbelievable. An immediate turnover from the restart. That could be vital. Sweden progressing. They've got a man free in the end zone. They find him. Good goal by Sweden. Disastrous play by USA. The grab made inside by Frederick Hedstrom. Not having our whole team there, like not wanting to be the first team from the US to lose at Worlds. They're within one point of the greatest upset in ultimate history. In the entire history of the sport, the reigning U.S. national champion had never lost a game at any international tournament. Yet it was game point for Sweden. Sweden have got their top defenseman out there as USA try to draw this level once again. Sweden with the pull. USA getting things going pretty swiftly with Skip Kuhn. Plays it out to Gewurz. Gewurz up forward again. A critical mistake by Dennis Warson. He didn't realize the pass was heading toward him. This could be it. Sweden then have a chance here to drive for the winning goal. Play that inside. And unbelievably, another turnover. Oh my God. That guy catches it. Sweden won that game. Neither team can keep possession. It's inevitable that that student you know, beats the teacher at some point in time. To grab that, as it was just skimming the blaze of grass. A long play. This could fall to Warson. He's going to go up for it. Warson makes the grab. Great goal. An unbelievable pass. High in the air. Warson watching, watching, watching. Goes up and brings it down. It's 20 all. Warson's sixth goal of the game. He's going to have to rewrite the final chapter of the history of Ultimate. That is if they win. Inside, a pass. Goal USA, and they've taken the lead again. Because just a point away from defeat. And here's a hammer cross field. That's hanging up, and that's going right to a US player. Kevin yeah. Rhodes. Rhodes has possession, gets it quickly to Kuhn. Dennis Warson who is not open. Gewurz has it, makes a play, has to go wide to Skip Kuhn, plays it inside. It's a goal for USA, and the World Championships go back to America. When I saw that Frisbee in the air, sailing towards that corner in the end zone, and Kevin just ready to catch it, I just, I felt complete elation. <laughs> it means you've gone through the entire tournament unbeaten. <laughs> yes, it doesn't feel that way, but, but it, we're undefeated, and in worlds since 1988 in the world championships representing the united states of america we've never been defeated we uh well it feels bad we were very close we've been playing them 88 it was a very close game but this felt even closer this is the last game for new york ultimate and i think it's only fitting that we played against our most important opponent so thank you all very much yeah we have a cheer that we like to do it usually goes what is it never enough what is it not enough We've got a new cheer now. What is it? Enough! Finally, in 1994, the ageless Steve Mooney and Boston would have their day. New York had disbanded after their fifth straight Nationals win in 93, and Boston was ready. I had a lot of respect for Boston. I thought they made us 100 times better. We were, we were so much better because we had to battle them tournament after tournament after tournament. I'll give New York an incredible amount of credit for hardening Boston. The sport went from total New York dominance to total Boston dominance. But new talented teams from Seattle, Santa Barbara, and San Francisco were competing fiercely to dethrone them, along with an up and coming Canadian team, Furious George, from Vancouver. Boston. 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 I think yeah, Boston. They are just money. Death the glory, death the glory. Fight, 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 fight. New York, New York was the dynasty before us. And they used to beat us all the time. It was just kind of depressing. We'd lose one game a year or one big game a year, and we'd lose to them. So this is six in a row if we get it. After 11 long years of just falling short, 
Six foot, seven inch Steve Mooney was finally on top. When we won six in a row, it's sort of a different level of excitement because we elevated the game in a way that maybe we hadn't done before. And to Boston, 1999 UPA Open Division champ, six times in a row. Just as ultimate can be both an intense sport and a kid's game, Mooney, Dobbins, and the entire generation of players from the 1980s are more alike than they are different. They did it all for nothing, and they couldn't have done it any other way. As a footnote to our show today, a brief look at a sport no school ever dropped, no scandal ever tainted. You'll find no referee on the field. All players are honor bound to call their own fouls. And the ultimate reward for their time, money and effort, nothing. Nothing save the joy of competition. A refreshing reminder of what sport was meant to be, and still, on rare occasions, can be. We don't have the millions of dollars behind it to, to pay the players what they're worth, but um, you know, for a lot of the players, they, they've had to compete at a you know, paying their own travel, term entry fees. You know, it's pretty expensive for guys to play at a high level. And so at a very minimum, we wanted to make sure they got a chance to um, compete for free, you know, not have not to come out with anything out of pocket. And then, you know, anything we can get them extra on top of that would be would be great. Not having to spend money on Ultimate is awesome. Player fees, $200, $800 plane tickets. It's definitely nice to go a season without having to pay for stuff. I'm proud of all the guys for sticking with the team through that. It's just we got to set our sights again on the next level. The general public is far more familiar with Ultimate now than ever before, but there's still work to be done to spread Ultimate to a new audience. Internet sensation Brody Smith is capitalizing on Ultimate's success and his three national championships by creating a hugely successful series of viral trick shot videos on YouTube. This right here is the world's fastest receiver. The whole idea about trick shots is really just getting kids excited about the Frisbee, getting them to buy a Frisbee for the first time, going out and throwing it for the first time. And then you get kids that are like, oh, I want to play Ultimate now. So. That was the whole kind of premise behind it, getting more people to look at it. Brody's trick shots have captivated a worldwide audience. So many people thought it was impossible that we could get fans out, then we got fans out, then people thought it was impossible we could put on a show, and we put on a show. It's been an awesome blessing to see the sport just really just blossom and grow the last couple months. There's no coddling for ultimate players. No glamour, no glory. Part of the reason why the sport was what it was and allowed us to be who we were in the sport was because it didn't have uh, sort of mainstream acceptance. And so that gave us the ability to kind of shape it and mold it, kind of allow our personalities to expand to fill whatever space there was for us. That wouldn't have been the same if the sport were more mainstream. I'd come back from nationals having won and I couldn't really tell most people what we'd done because they wouldn't understand. They just didn't understand what the sport was or how hard we worked or what we'd accomplished. Nobody really made anything other than, than memories of, of, of wins and great relationships and, and frankly, things that, that are worth so much more than money. I mean, you know, I can tell you right now that the, the closest friends I have to this day are people I played ultimate with. It's a bond that is worth a lot more than money. When I'm out there running, you know, repeat 200s at 24 pace, which is fast for most people. And they say, what are you training for? I used to say soccer, track, but now I say train for ultimate. And I, I get a lot of people being like, what? You know, why is this person training so hard for a sport that I don't even understand what it is? My career is uh, one that definitely had the line. So is that the game with the dog? Absolutely, we were fighting for legitimacy. and. A sport that's born on a parking lot in Columbia, New Jersey, it's gonna fight for legitimacy. So I don't mind that we're fighting. We're still growing, and that's great. We had a little secret that we were great, and we, were, we achieved things that nobody had ever achieved before, and we climbed the mountain and put our stake on the top in a way that nobody else ever had. We made a new mountain and climbed it and put our stake on the top. And the only people who really could understand that are my teammates. And to a lesser extent, the people who played were playing the sport during the same period. But it was our, almost our little secret. 
And that tightens the sense of community, of loyalty, and affection I really have for those people. One of the things that's amazed me recently about Ultimate Players is all these people who I played against for all those years and then I kind of lost touch with, they're kind of circling back into my life as professionals. And they all do a lot of cool stuff. They're involved in their communities and always, you know, hiking or backpacking or starting nonprofits or just, you know, doing really cool stuff. In the fall of 2012, at the World Junior Ultimate Games in Dublin, Ireland, the spirit of the game overshadowed the competition as Muslims and Jews sweated and competed and laughed and sang together as teammates playing for the same Israeli team. The country of Israel sent a bunch of junior teams to Worlds, and there were teams that had Jews and Arabs on it, which is virtually unheard of. And not only did they go, which was a huge accomplishment, but they did really well. The fact that they could send that group together to an international competition is uh, pretty magic stuff. You can't make that stuff up, right? And you see the, you see the connections that these guys are forming. It's a pretty amazing thing when you see people whose families have been trying to kill each other be put into a boiling pot where you're no longer from the West Bank, you're no longer from, you know, Gaza. You're now on the red team, you're on the yellow team, you're on the green team. I really love the idea of sending in a sport to kind of link differences between different groups of people. Those relationships that you form are without question the most lasting strong ties it's all the right things about ultimate it's ultimate in its best purest form it's everything that we took out of it individually and be able to share that in that place is really magical ultimate peace is the soul of the sport's roots and represents its greatest endeavors I don't just want to look back at my pictures and say, wow, wasn't I great? I want to take this sport and I want to go somewhere with it. I want to make something really special happen. Exciting game today as the All Stars are taking on Revolver, who won the World Championships in Japan just last month and were the USA Ultimate Champions in Sarasota last October. This has been a big game on the map for everyone involved. Next Gen will be starting this game on defense. Jimmy Mickle with a pull. Revolver starting off. Rasmussen on the sideline, up to Bo. And he goes to the end zone. Revolver able to get the first goal of the game. Showing kids at a young age that there's a sport out there where you can run hard, you can jump, you can be quick, you can throw, you can do all the things that I think make a sport wonderful, and you can do that all in one point. Tommy Lee goes deep, Jacob Jannon is there. Smooth offensive point for the bus. As Tommy Lee goes deep immediately, tying the game at one to one. I was skeptical of the whole process. It was like, oh, it's just a beach sport. It's just some sporting goods company came up with a way to, to sell more Frisbees or another product or whatever it was. But it really was very grassroots, and I was very impressed with just how genuine the whole process was. Bayless with Dylan Freechild catches up and gets the D. There wasn't the pushiness. There wasn't the club feel um, that you get in soccer. There wasn't the, the hollering, for one thing. To break into half. Johnson to Driscoll, and Driscoll is there getting the score. Connection takes half for the world champions, 8-6. to six. I've been around youth sports a lot. I coach soccer and, and baseball and softball. And one of the things that sort of disturbs me is the intensity level of it. Well, in this case, what really struck me was just the joyfulness of the whole thing. It really won me over very quickly. Allison Hall, Allison Hall running it down. One of the things that I love about Ultimate is that it's still evolving. Well, Ultimate never leaves you. I mean, it's in, it's in for life. I think it's got enough momentum now that it's going to stick. And I think Ultimate's definitely going to be around in 15 years, and it's going to be around in 50 years, and it's going to be around in 100 years. And it might not be as grassroots, and, and the people playing it 
might have trainers and referees, and they might miss out on all of those things that we all had to do ourselves, but it'll still be this great sport played with a flying disc. Catch to get the break, extend the All-Stars lead to three. They are up 11 to eight. Who doesn't want to be bigger and more, more well-loved and, and more lucrative and all those kinds of things? Who doesn't want to see something they love do better? Going up early to take next gen, to game point. Money doesn't really, it can't get you anywhere more than your passion and love can. And I think the idea of the sport just now coming and the changes it's going through, to be a part of that and to be able to define what the sport's gonna be for the future is a great opportunity that not many people will ever get. Reach out, get the D back. It's really an interesting issue. Is, is, is sports get bigger, do they get better? And, and so it's, it's fun to follow Ultimate and sort of see where it's going and seeing if it can stay, stay true to its spirit. So uh, I'll be watching. It's tough to tell man you make the call. It's just a game, flat ball. I think you might have missed it. You're out of bounds. You can check your swollen ego at the lost and found. What is Team Mom? Mother of Ken Dobbins, and she's at all the tournaments, isn't she? Yeah, she's unbelievable, Dwight. She's been to Europe with them for the World Championships, Colorado, wherever their team goes, she is there making sandwiches, Gatorade, fruit. She definitely gives it a big advantage to the New York team. <laughs> no, I wish she was my mom. That's funny. A frisbee is not like a ball, really. It's more of a flat ball. That's right. I spat in his face. I feel That's badly right. about it. He's fat my face. <laughs> but what about the showering, Pat? <laughs> yeah. Not using soap. That was my. Well, you but know. You rinsed. I didn't use soap. But you rinsed. It was New York City water. You know, it's dirty water. But you rinsed. I rinsed. You did. You rinsed. Yeah. All right. I had a job. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs>